we want to keep talking about methods around the spectral uh, techniques that allow us to solve uh, PDs faster or more accurately. And so one of the important tricks out there is what's called pseudospectral techniques uh, with filtering. So what this allows us to do is to start thinking about leveraging some of the properties we know about our PDE in order to make a faster solver. And in particular, a lot of this methodology is going after what's called numerical stiffness. In other words, when you have a model that makes you take really small time steps because you have higher derivatives typically or rapid transitions in your solution, this method can actually really help uh, limit the computation time by explicitly taking advantage of things you know about your PDE. So I want to introduce this in the context of what is in fact a problem that becomes numerically stiff, which is a problem, hyper, uh, hyper diffusion problem. So this is just a simple problem. I can write down the solution analytically. In fact, let's just Fourier transform it. If you Fourier transform this, you just get this ODE here. You can just write down the solution. So what's the problem with this? Because it seems so easy, but we got this higher derivative, but it doesn't seem any harder than a second order heat equation except for the following. When you're going to do this and you solve something like this with a higher derivative computationally, we have to start talking about putting this in the wave number space. So consider, for instance, if you're going to solve this and your maximum wave number value is 64. So for instance, if you're doing something like 128 modes, you have your k numbers going from negative 64 to 64. So the biggest k value you have is 64. But now, notice, this has a k to the fourth. So this 64 is going to be raised to the fourth power, which is, you know, here's your number. So in other words, uh, that's, that's a fairly large number that you've got to work with. Oh, I think it's actually got cut off here. So this is like, uh, anyway, so your k max is something like 10 to the 10. So, right, so you can start getting these really big numbers that are you're multiplying things with. Okay, so 10 to the 10, you say, well, that's fine. A computer can just do the math, except for when you're time stepping, your ODE solver often has 10 to minus 6 accuracy. So even these small modes that are out there, numer the numerical round off that comes from your numerical stepper is 10 to minus 6. So if you take something that's 10 to minus 6, which is very small, so you usually don't worry about it, but now you're multiplying by something that's 10 to the 10, which is big, 10 to the 4 which means it's going to have to really crank down your time steps to keep this error being small. So this is a huge problem. Higher derivatives usually lead to numerical stiffness issues. You don't want higher derivatives in your problem, but if you've got them and have to deal with them, then this is always going to be a problem for you. And look at this. You don't get, you see this problem in CFL conditioning when you do finite differences, and you see it here in terms of these wave numbers that are being raised to the highest power of the derivative here. They both create numerical stiffness issues for you. So how can we get around this? Well, I want to show you and introduce to you as a technique of pseudospectral methods with filtering. Okay, so it's really based upon a very simple idea of ODE theory for solving linear differential equations first order. And in fact, this differential equation here, uh, when I took differential equations, I think we covered this in the very first day of class. So it's not like it's advanced ODE theory, it's like day one ODE theory. And what was introduced in that solution technique was to simply say, let's multiply both sides of this equation by some mu. And of course, we didn't talk about how to get that mu, but we said if we do this, maybe I can pick a mu so that I can turn this into, if I pick it right, could I find a mu so that when I, this left side becomes a perfect differential, okay? That was the objective. And so mu is called the integrating factor. Is there a mu I can pick out so that this whole left side, when I take the derivative of it, uh, of this here, it becomes this left-hand side. And you can do that if you pick your mu to be E the integral of p of t dt, and then your solution y is just given by here. So this is the first solution techniques out of an ODE course, because the first order, you have these terms here, and just you find this integrating factor method. This is exactly what we're going to use in, in this pseudo-spectral filtering method. We're going to say, 
for the linear term, maybe I can find an integrating factor so that I can explicitly solve for the linear term. So remember, the problematic term in your simulation was that fourth order derivative, which was linear. Okay, you can't use this technique if it's a nonlinear higher order derivative term, but often the higher order derivatives are linear terms in a lot of our physics based models. And what we want to do is say, well, I know how to solve that exactly, so take it out of the problem. Explicitly take care of it uh, right at the beginning. So let's consider a nonlinear PDE. So there's a linear part and a nonlinear part. And what we're going to assume here is that the linear part has the problematic term, maybe a higher derivative. And so what we can do is say, okay, how about the following? Let's do the same thing we just saw before. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say, I'm going to Fourier transform this. And in a Fourier transform, this is what it looks like. Now it looks almost exactly like the problem we had in ODE theory. There's this piece here. This is typically a linear, it's a linear operator with derivatives, which every, that gives you rise to what the A of K is. So you give me the linear operator, I'll get some alpha K here. So here's the linear term with the nonlinear part. Remember the nonlinear part is just, now it's just, I have to have the full nonlinearity, take the FFT of it. I've, I've got not, not much to do there except to just work with the FFT. But now what I can do is take this linear part, move it over to the left hand side, and ask the same question. Is there something I could multiply this both sides with so that if I multiply this side by, in fact, here's what I'm doing, this exactly, I'm doing multiply my e to the minus alpha kt both sides, and then what that means is then the left-hand side now becomes a perfect differential. So DDT of this left-hand side is what gets here is equal to this right-hand side. So what I've effectively done is I've solved for the linear part exactly. That's what this term is here. That is the solution to this linear part, which is here. In fact, if that wasn't here, I'd have the exact solution. So I'm just saying, look, I already know the solution exactly to the linear part. Let's actually put it in explicitly. And then this is what I get here. And so now what I have, I'm going to call this the variable v. And now I have an od for v, where I step in v, and then I have to come back out to you. So it's very much like what you do in Fourier transform, which is if you have a nonlinear term, you have to go into the Fourier domain, take one step, come back out, recompute the nonlinearity, Fourier transform, come back in. But now I'm doing one extra step as coming in and out of the variable v, and I'm stepping in the variable v, and the variable v has explicitly uh, taken into account the linear solution. So instead of having my numerical scheme try to solve for the linear part, I've actually solved for it explicitly because I actually knew the answer to that. And this here, this filtering technique, is really powerful because what it allows you to do is take much larger steps in the solution technique and gets around the numerical stiffness issues. For my PhD thesis, I was working on a, for, a problem that had a fourth order diffusion term with a bunch of nonlinearities. And without this scheme, I had to take time steps of delta t that were 10 to the minus 6 to resolve it. But once I did this, I could take time steps of 10 to the minus 3. So that, you know, that's three orders of magnitude faster. And when I was in grad school, we had really slow computers, so this was save the day for me and my thesis. Okay. So let's uh, let's ex explicitly represent this and how we would do this in a, in a specific example. So what you're looking at here is the Fischer-Kolmogorov equation. So it's got a diffusion term, a cubic, and a linear term. And so what I can do is Fourier transform this. So the Fourier transform of the second derivative just pops an i k squared out. And then you have the Fourier transform of the nonlinearity. Not much you can do there. Plus Fourier transform of the linear term. I can combine this term with the linear term. Here we go. And if it, if it weren't here, if this cubic weren't here, I could solve this explicitly. And here's the solution. e to the minus c minus kx squared t. So actually, that's my integrating factor. And so now my stepper is I step forward in v, which has the linear solution embedded in it. And of course, I have to keep updating u here, keep coming back to the real domain u to compute u in order to compute u cubed Fourier transform. So I take a step there, I come back from v to u, then to u, compute what u is, then I can recompute all of this and take steps forward. So it's a, it's, so I, I'm in and out of the Fourier domain, and I'm in and out from u hat to v hat domain. Okay? So that's the algorithm.
and what I've accept, and again, what I've explicitly done is I've just wrapped up the linear solution directly in my code itself. Okay, so here's the general theory, and so that was for the fisher mccormick golf equation, but this is the general idea, right? So the general stepper is I have my long linear PDE, I learn if I Fourier transform the linear part, that's what this minus alpha k is, that's the Fourier transform of the linear part, this is the solution to that linear part, and I just explicitly encode it here. So the way the algorithm works, I start off with some initial condition u, I can compute n of u before I transform it, and then I take a step in v, when I take a step in v, I actually come back out to u hat, come back to u, re-update the n of u, come back into this thing. And what I've effectively done is removed numerical stiffness. And it makes an amazing difference because you've actually used knowledge that you had about the linear solution and you directly embedded it in your numerical stepper. This is such a smart thing to do. And it's a, and of course, if you only have two derivatives in L, it, it probably won't make much difference, but as soon as you get, start to get three, four derivatives up here in space, it will completely change your ability to solve the problem. Okay, so uh, before I end some of this, we're going to talk some more about spectral methods, but I do want to end with a few key comparisons between spectral and finite difference. So this is a really kind of important point at which we've been, we've had lectures on finite differences. We had quite a few of those, discretization, setting up everything in a finite difference way, and then marching forward. Now we're talking about spectral methods, which are using things like Fourier transform or Chebyshev polynomials, or any kind of basis expansions, really, to represent things. And so there are some different factors we want to consider. How would you choose a method? And this becomes really important in practice because we haven't really dug down to this. We've just shown here's a variety of ways to solve these problems. But really, your choice comes down to these four things that you want to be thinking about. So first of all, let's talk about accuracy. On the accuracy side, spectral methods are what are called exponentially accurate, whereas finite difference methods are polynomial accuracies. So you pick a scheme, like a second order, fourth order scheme, but uh, spectral methods have uh, are beyond all orders of accuracy. All that means is they're much more accurate. So when it comes to accuracy, if you can use a spectral method, it is the right choice to be making. It is much more accurate for the same number of grid, grid points that you would be using. The implication is also is that for a certain accuracy with finite differences, you might be able to use a lot less points to get the same accuracy with spectral methods. In either case, spectral methods win the day here. Implementation. Let's talk about the practical implementation aspects. Almost all the work of implementation that happened with finite differences was in building the derivative matrices, organizing the data, figuring out how those derivative matrices acting on my organization produces a first derivative, a second derivative, a Laplacian, whatever. So most of the work there in implementation on finite differences is building matrices. But on the spectral side, Fourier transforms, most of the implementation is you keeping track of going in and out of the Fourier domain, which you are consistently, constantly doing in your loops. So that's, so you could say that they're kind of even. Implementation-wise, finite differences, you're doing a lot of it up front, but then spectral, you're doing it on the fly, coming in and out of the Fourier domain. So each, each has its own negative, let's say, in keeping man and managing how they work. Computational efficiency, this is clearly spectral methods uh, as winners. Oftentimes, like even when we solve the shallow water equations, from the last lecture when we did an implementation, we're doing it n log n time, whereas if you're using finite difference methods, your stream function solve, if you're solving it order n squared versus n log n, especially as you start getting, you know, if you start doing a grid size of 1024 by 1024, you will, you will wait forever in front of your computer with, with the finite difference methods, whereas the Fourier transform will actually do it pretty, very rapidly. There is no comparison. If you can use a spectral method, you always do. It is always faster, faster, faster. 
So at least from the accuracy and the computational efficiency, spectral methods always win. Implementation even. Now we come to the boundary conditions. The Achilles heel of spectral methods is the limited boundary conditions that you can enforce. For a Fourier transform, it's periodic. Sine transform, it's pinned. Cosine transform, it's no flux. Once you're outside, you know, and of course that's why I introduced Chebyshev polynomials, which gives you a little bit more flexibility in terms of not having such constraint, but you still don't get that much more flexibility. Whereas with finite differences, you have a very general platform for imposing boundary conditions. So when you're choosing a method, if you have hard boundary conditions, you're almost forced to use finite difference or finite elements. And we'll talk about finite elements in the next set of lectures. But this is, this is the decision point is almost right here. If you have a boundary condition amenable to spectral, you always use spectral. If your boundary condition is not amenable to spectral, use finite differences. Okay? So I'm just giving some practical guidelines here for you to choose a methodology that you would implement to solve practically PDEs. And these are the considerations you would be making in all of it. So think about that, and whenever you have a problem, your first task is to evaluate, start evaluating what should I be using, start with the boundary conditions, and then work your way from there into, uh, into actually being able to try to figure out can I actually solve this in reasonable time with some methods and how you would implement it from there. So that is, uh, and you know, again, and there's all kinds of tricks here. We talked here about spectral filtering in addition to performance, and so just think about these methods because everything's about how quickly can I solve these problems and how accurately, um, and so your job is to not just get the solution, but to get it as quickly as possible, as accurately as possible.